Welcome. I'm Dr. Billy Bullock, and I'm here today with my assistant, Ann Rogers. You're in for a real treat. I am starting a new series loosely based on Dr. Sheldon Cooper's acclaimed 52-week series on vexillology. How many of you watched Big Bang Theory's series on vexillology? I'm sure many of you did. And vexillology is a cool word, isn't it, Ann? Yes, it is. That should be an industrial hygiene term. Oh well, sit back and be dazzled by this equally interesting topic of OELs. There are many different types of OELs. TLVs, PELs, RELs, wheels, and max. But Dr. B, what are OELs? Well, Anne, I'm glad you asked. They are the levels of exposure determined to be safe for workers to be exposed to for eight hours a day, five days a week, 52 weeks a year for a work lifetime and not suffer any adverse health effect from that exposure. Who develops the OELs, Dr. B? The first OELs were developed by the American Conference of Governmental Industrial Hygienists, and they date back to the 30s. In fact, Anne, ACGH is celebrating their 75th anniversary this year. Now, now what it means to me, S E G I H T L V. Tell me how you protect me. Oh, tell me protect me. One of the first TLVs developed was for asbestos. Asbestos is a naturally occurring mineral. The photos on this slide are from a trip I took to the state of Alaska back in the 90s. The mineral serpentinite could be seen in the rock formations all around the area of Coal Creek Camp. There are many other areas in the United States and Canada that also have outcroppings of naturally occurring asbestos. Here is an example of one of the rocks that I picked up while I was at Coal Creek Camp. And some of the raw fibers can be seen in this sample. One of the first OELs that was developed came about from a study carried out by W.C. Driesen. He was a medical doctor and assistant surgeon general with the U.S. Public Health Service. He and his team studied workers in textile mills using asbestos during the mid-30s. And in 1938, they published the findings from their studies. Driesen and his team observed that workers in areas that had asbestos exposures above 5 million particles per cubic foot had high rates of observed fibrotic lung disease. They also observed that there was an absence of disease in workers that had exposures less than 5 million particles per cubic foot. They drew the scientific conclusion that if workers maintained their exposures below 5 million particles per cubic foot, that there would be an absence of lung disease. This 5 million particle per cubic foot value became one of the first ACGH TLVs. So these early OELs were based on workplace sampling and medical testing of the workers. By looking at workers that had existing disease and determining what their workplace exposures were, early industrial hygienists and occupational medical professionals derived these safe levels by differentiating the levels where they observed disease from those levels where they did not observe disease. 
It's important to note that these early OELs were based on actual air monitoring data and examination of the workers that exhibited symptoms of disease. As you can imagine, sampling back in the 30s and 40s was very difficult. The technology did not exist to analyze for many materials, and the sampling devices were large and bulky. Fully manual handcrite pumps and impingers such as the one that my assistant Ann is demonstrating. Here is a photo of one of those first hand crank pumps produced by MSA. Later, we began relying on animal test data to establish the safe levels of exposures for workers. For example, when I was working on my master's degree at Tulane, we were doing exposure chamber testing on mice. We would expose these mice to very high concentrations of asbestos and then study the lung tissue to see what diseases were observed. We noted from these studies that the microphages in the lungs could digest or break down the chrysotile asbestos whereas we did not observe this phenomena with amphibole type asbestos such as amosite. Using this data, the OEL setting organizations are able to develop safe levels of exposure for a greater number of chemicals. So just how similar are mice and men? Well we just don't know for sure. Most of the animal studies expose these animals to unrealistically high levels of the agent during a short period of time. This heavy loading creates additional uncertainty around the data. As a result, we have to build in a lot of safety factors. The resultant OELs are usually very conservative. The better OELs are based in part on real workplace exposure data. For some of these, they're related to emergency work, while others come from studies like the NIOSH health hazard evaluation for popcorn flavoring diacetyl. Popcorn, Dr. B? Oh, no thanks. Two of the most recent large-scale human studies come from the World Trade Center and Deepwater Horizon incidences. During these cleanup activities, tens of thousands of air samples were collected on the workers. These workers are now being followed medically to see if they develop any disease. The level of, of observed disease or lack of disease will then be correlated back to actual exposure data. This will, this will result in a more scientific-based OEL. However, the results are still decades away. So for now, we still have to rely mostly on animal data, like mice. Dr. B, not that type of mice. Well, very observant, and you're right this type of mouse. However, we do have some studies that are based on new laboratory tests using actual human tissue. These tests hold promise because we do not have to factor in the differences between mouse biology and human biology. Are you confused, Anne? Just a little. Well, that's probably because you don't have a doctorate like me. However, don't worry. Rest assured that there is a lot of good science behind the OELs. In addition to this uncertainty, the organizations build in safety factors to make sure that workers are protected. And in the case of ACGH's TLVs, they have 75 years of scientific history behind them. Yeah.
Now, we also need to mention that there are different types of OELs based on time or duration of potential exposure. For example, most OELs are based on full shift exposures, 8-hour time weighted averages, or TWAs. However, some chemicals that bioaccumulate, that means they remain in the body for a long period of time before being removed, have short-term limits of exposure. These are called STELs, and they're usually established for a 15-minute exposure period. Next, we have sealant limits, which are never to exceed values. These are developed for chemicals that cause eyes, nose, or throat irritation. Examples of these are chlorine, ammonia, and tear gas. The last one, called excursion limit, is primarily used for asbestos and is a 30-minute exposure period. Again, this is based on the slow clearance of asbestos fibers from the lungs. The TWA is the most common exposure limit. These can be 8-hour or 12-hour exposure periods. This type of limit takes into account the high and the lows of exposure periods throughout the day. For chemicals that bioaccumulate or metabolize very slowly, for example lead, it is important to keep peak or short-term exposures to a minimum in order to keep the daily dose from exceeding the TWA. Then for highly irritating chemicals like ammonia and chlorine, a never to exceed level called the sealant limit has been established. This is usually set at the level where most people, or the average person, would begin experiencing symptoms of irritation such as eye, nose, or throat irritation, burning, stinging, or watering of the eyes. Well now, I just don't know why OSHA decided to introduce a new type of OEL in their asbestos standard. They could have established a 15-minute stell, but maybe they just wanted to be different. There are some workers that may be able to tolerate higher exposures and not suffer any adverse health effect. However, the OELs are established for the average worker, not those supermen. Dr. B, what about us above average women? No, Ann, we have to focus on levels that protect the majority of the workers in the population. Okay, our time for this episode is coming to an end. I want to stress the point that if we keep worker exposures below the OELs, we will, be, we will be providing them with a safe and healthy work environment. Now, sadly enough, we're out of time. However, I know you will look forward to next week's riveting episode on your Cytochrome P450 system. You will learn how to safely exercise this system to keep it in shape and working at peak levels. Thank you and tune in next week.